Hi there! Now before we jump into the video, I have a very important question for you. Have you subscribed to our channel? If not, then subscribe right now to stay updated with the latest and brand new Skadia.com lectures. And click on the bell icon to stay notified about new releases. We upload a full lecture every single week with some short videos sprinkled in between. So, that being said, now that you've subscribed, let's return to the lecture. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Hena Khan and today I'm presenting a bone that is present behind the maxilla and is involved in the formation of the heart palate, the nasal cavity and the floor of the orbit. In many animal species, it is located above the uvula in the throat. I know you guys are very genius and from the word palate, you must have guessed that we're talking about the palatine bone today. The palatine bone, or in Latin, os platinum, is a paired, flat, irregular facial bone, as you can see here. Before proceeding ahead, let's have a review of all the views of the palatine bone. It will help you understand every aspect easily. Anterior and posterior are placed side by side for better understanding. Then we have a bottom or inferior view. And lastly, a similar one, which is the lateral and the medial view. As you can better understand now that medial means towards the body and lateral means away from the body. You must be wondering where the word palatine came from. So let me tell you the word palatine refers to the Palatine Hills in Rome, which is one of the seven important hills in Rome. Because the curved appearance of the palate is resembling the Palatine Hill closely. When the skull is viewed in the anterior aspect, the palatine bone appears as this. Then we have the inferior or the ventral view. And lastly, the mid-sagittal view of the skull. As you can see, the palatine bones are all colored in purple. Now coming towards its features. Remember, the palatine bone is composed of two plates. First of all, the horizontal plate, and then we have the perpendicular plate, which are connected to form this characteristic L shape, as you can appreciate well over here. Now, this bone features three processes, the pyramidal, orbital, and sphenoidal. The palatine bone help house the primary pain signaling pathways, for the mouth and the teeth, as they house the greater palatine foramina, which are the openings that allow the palatine nerves to pass through. The palatine bone articulates with five bones, maxilla, sphenoid, ethmoid, inferior nasal concha, and womer. Primarily, the palatine bone serves as a structural function, with its shape helping carve out important structures within the head and defining the lower wall of the inside of the cranium. The palatine bone's horizontal plate is just behind the maxilla bone while lying in front of the soft palate, which we know is the soft tissue at the roof of the mouth. The end of this bone perpendicular plate closest to the back of the head articulates with the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. As you can appreciate over here, this yellow colored bone is basically the sphenoid bone. So we can say that the palatine bones are situated at the back of the nasal cavity between the maxilla and the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone, as you can see over here. 
On the upper border, this bone helps form the base of the orbital process, which we will discuss further on. Now, keeping in view the location, palatine bones contributes to the walls of three cavities. First of all, the roof of the mouth, the floor and the lateral walls of the nasal cavity, as you can appreciate over here, and then the floor of the orbits or the eye sockets. The roof of the oral cavity and the floor of the nasal cavity together mix up the palate, which is going to separate the oral and the nasal cavities. Now, talking about the palate, we have two types of palates. First of all, the hot palate, which is present anteriorly, known as the palatum dorum, and the soft palate, known as the palatum mole, forms the posterior part. Hot palate is immobile. Its rostral part or anterior aspect consists of the palatine process of the maxilla and the horizontal plate of the palatine bone is in its posterior aspect together comprising of the hot palate. The basic function of the hot palate is contributing to the phonation of the consonants while we are talking and serves as a support for the tongue when crushing the food. On the other hand, the soft palate is positioned posteriorly and it's quite flexible. It helps in swallowing and it comprises of muscle fibers covered by a mucous membrane. Now, as we have discussed the location and the positioning of the palatine bone, let's discuss the palatine sutures that are present in close vicinity of the palatine bone. The palatine bone consists of three types of sutures. Interpalatine suture, then we have a median palatine suture, and we have a transverse palatine suture. The horizontal plate of the palatine bone is connected in the midline by the interpalatine suture. The median palatine suture connects the horizontal plates of the palatine. It is pos the posterior continuation of the intermaxillary suture, which is also known as the median palatine suture, highlighted in green over here. If you see dorsally, the transverse palatine suture also known as the palatomaxillary suture, adheres the palatine processes of the maxillary bone to the palatine bone on the posterior aspect. As you can see over here, we have this interpalatine suture, which is the continuation of the intermaxillary suture. The two horizontal plates articulate with each other at the posterior aspect of the median palatine suture and more anteriorly with the maxilla at the transverse palatine suture. Moreover, the palatine bone contributes to the skeletal framework of the inferior orbital fissure, pterygo palatine with the sphenoidal bone and the pterygoid fossa. As this bone is a part of the nasal septum, our friend Max has another cool mnemonic for all of you for a better memorization. Peter nose starts flowing vigorously every morning. Where? P stands for palatine bones. N stands for nasal bones. S stands for sphenoid bone. F stands for frontal bone. V stands for vomer. E stands for ethmoid. And lastly, M stands for maxilla. So this is how you can memorize the bones involved in the formation of nasal septum. I hope until now you guys are having a clear image about the articulation, location, and functions of the palatine bone. So let's move forward towards the anatomical landmarks. Let's have a recall. Generally, we can say the palatine bone is composed of two plates, the horizontal and the perpendicular plate, which are connected and form a characteristic L-shaped bone. 
And this bone features three processes, a pyramidal process, orbital process, and a sphenoidal process. So first of all, let's discuss the horizontal plate of the palatine bone. Now this horizontal plate of the palatine bone is located in a transverse plane. It comprises of a bony core of the posterior quarter of the heart palate and a part of the floor of the nasal cavity. As you can see clearly here, the palate is quadrangular in shape. It is having a medial, a lateral, anterior, and a posterior border. So it basically possesses two surfaces. The palatine surface, which is going to face towards the oral cavity, and the nasal surface towards the nasal cavity. Now moving on to the detailed anatomy of all the borders of the palatine bone of the horizontal plate. First of all, let's go through the medial border of the horizontal plate, which is articulating with the horizontal plate of the contralateral palatine bone. From the nasal side, the articulating line between the two plates forms the posterior part of the nasal crest, which in turn is going to articulate with the vomer bone. So this is the nasal crest over here, and it is going to articulate with the vomer bone. Now moving on to the lateral border of the horizontal plate. It is continuous with the perpendicular plate. It features the greater palatine foramen through which the greater palatine nerves and the vessels pass through. Coming to the anterior border, it articulates with the palatine process of the maxilla. Together, the horizontal plate of the palatine bone and the maxilla comprises of the hard palate. The posterior border faces the posterior wall of the pharynx. The medial ends of the posterior surfaces of both horizontal plates together form a bony projection in the midline, which is called as the median posterior nasal spine. And this function of the spine is to serve as an attachment site for the uvular muscles. Now, moving on towards the surfaces of the horizontal plate that has already been mentioned to you, we have two surfaces, the nasal surface and then we have the palatine surface. The nasal surface of the horizontal plate of the palatine bone, also called as the superior surface, is concave from side to side and forms the posterior portion of the nasal cavity and a part of the inferior nasal meatus. Moving on towards the other surface, which is the palatine surface. Now the palatine surface of the horizontal plate of the palatine bone, also called as the inferior surface, is slightly concave and rough and it forms the corresponding surface of the opposite bone it comprises of the posterior one-fourth of the heart palate. Near its posterior margin, it may be seen here, there is a marked transverse ridge for the attachment of the aponeurosis of the tensor villi palatini. We'll discuss it later in the further section on muscular attachments. The medial end of the posterior border of the horizontal plate of palatine bone is sharp and pointed and in conjunction of the opposite bone it forms a projecting process the posterior nasal spine for the attachment of the musculus uvula it must be noted here that the posterior margin of the horizontal plates along with the posterior nasal spine is related to the connection of all of the muscles of the soft palate Time for some interesting facts. Now the horizontal plate of the palatine bone serves as a cephalometric landmark. Cephalometry is basically the measurement and study of the proportions of the head and face, especially during development and growth. It is frequently used by dentists, orthodontists, 
and oral and maxillofacial surgeons as a treatment planning tool. The horizontal plate of the palatine bone features two openings. We have a greater palatine foramen and we have the lesser palatine foramen. The greater palatine foramen is a small opening in the horizontal plate of the palatine bone which serves as a passage for the greater palatine nerves coming out from the greater palatine canal into the oral cavity. Now you must be wondering what greater palatine canal is up to. It is the passage going through the sphenoidal and the palatine bones connecting the pterygo palatine fossa to the oral cavity. The basic function is to transmit the descending palatine vessels, the greater palatine nerve, and the lesser palatine nerve. Now moving on to the lesser palatine foramina. They are referred to as one or more small foramina representing the openings in the hot palate of the palatine surface of the horizontal plate of the lesser palatine canal that is basically transmitting the lesser palatine nerves. It carries the lesser palatine nerves and vessels to the lesser palatine foramina on the posterior lateral surface of the heart palate. So let's move on towards the anatomical features of the perpendicular plate now. The perpendicular plate of the palatine bone continues from the lateral margin of the horizontal plate. Now it bears its name due to the fact that it's making 90 degrees angle with the horizontal plate as you can appreciate here forming a noticeable L shape to the palatine bone as you can clearly observe here. So generally speaking, the perpendicular plate has two surfaces, a nasal surface and then a maxillary surface and it possesses four borders, an anterior one, posterior, superior and an inferior border. The borders of the perpendicular plate serves for the articulation with the neighboring bones. Anterior border shows a laminar projection at the level of the conchal crest that articulates with the inferior nasal concha and forms a part of the medial wall of the maxillary sinus. Then we have the posterior border, which is serrated and it articulates with the medial pterygoid plate of the sphenoid bone. The sphenoidal process continues from the superior part of the posterior border, while the pyramidal process continues from its inferior part. The superior border articulates with the body of the sphenoid. It is marked by the sphenopalatine notch, which is basically closed superiorly by the sphenoidal body and converted into the sphenopalatine foramen. This foramen is basically a connection between the pterygopalatine fossa and the superior nasal meatus, transmitting the posterior superior nasal nerves and sphenopalatine vessels in between them. The anterior part of the superior border projects into the orbital process of the palatine bone. The inferior border of the perpendicular plate is continuous with the lateral border of the horizontal plate. So if you can recall, we have two surfaces, the nasal surface and then we have the maxillary surface. The nasal surface of the perpendicular plate faces the nasal cavity, forming a part of its lateral wall. The inferior part of the surface is marked by a concavity that contributes to the inferior nasal meatus. Now, meatus, as we know, they are basically the bony projections in the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. Superior to this, conchal crest is present via which it articulates with the inferior nasal concas. 
Above this crest, there is a shallow concavity that comprises a part of the middle nasal meatus. Now, superior to this concavity is the ethmoidal crest, onto which is the middle nasal concha attachment. The maxillary surface of the perpendicular plate articulates with the nasal surface of the maxilla. It is mostly rough and irregular, except in its posterior superior and anterior portions. The posterior superior smooth area forms the medial wall of the pterygo palatine fossa while the anterior smooth area forms the posterior portion of the medial wall of the maxillary sinus. The maxillary surface is also marked by an oblique groove, which is called the greater palatine groove. It transmits the structures which pass through the greater palatine foramen. As I told you previously, so, the adjacent surface of the maxilla closes this groove, converting it into the greater palatine canal, as you must be familiar that transmits the greater palatine nerve, artery, and vein. Now you must be well familiar with the three processes of the palatine bone, the orbital, sphenoidal, and the pyramidal process. Let's discuss these processes in detail now. The pyramidal process of the palatine bone arises from the junction between the horizontal and the perpendicular plates. It passes between the medial and the lateral pterygoid plate of the sphenoid bone. You can better appreciate this in this view. See passing between the medial and the lateral pterygoid plate. You must remember these three surfaces of the pyramidal process are important from articulation point of view. Posterior, lateral, and the inferior surface. The posterior surface that articulates with the pterygoid plates forming the inferior part of the pterygoid fossa. The lateral surface which provides the attachment site for the superficial head of the medial pterygoid muscle and the inferior surface it features the lesser palatine foramina for the passage of the lesser palatine nerves and vessels. Now coming to the orbital process it basically originates from the anterior part of the perpendicular plate. As it originates from the orbital margin it is called the orbital process. This process shows a narrow neck, three articular, and two non-articular surfaces. Let's discuss the articular surfaces first. They are the anterior, posterior, and the medial surfaces. The anterior surface, also known as the maxillary surface, is directed anteriorly, and laterally, it articulates with the maxilla. The posterior surface, also known as the sphenoidal surface. It faces superiorly and posterior medially and is marked by an opening of an air sinus that is contained within this process via which the sinus communicates with the sphenoidal sinus. Lastly, we have the medial surface known as the ethmoidal surface. It courses anteriorly and medially. It articulates with the labyrinth of the ethmoid bone. In some individuals, this surface is the one that contains an opening of the air sinus instead of the posterior surface. In this case, the bone communicates with the posterior ethmoidal air cells rather than the sphenoidal sinus. Now coming to the two non-articular surfaces of the orbital process, they are the superior or the orbital and the lateral one. The superior or the orbital surface forms a part of the floor of the bony orbit, while the lateral surface forms a part of the 
Terrigo palatine fossa. These two surfaces are separated by a notch that forms the medial part of the inferior border of the inferior orbital fissure. Moving on, let's discuss the sphenoidal process now. The sphenoidal process courses superior medially from the superior part of the posterior border of the perpendicular plate. Its superior surface articulates with the sphenoidal concha and the root of the medial pterygoid plate. This surface is also marked by a groove that forms a part of the palato-vaginal canal. The inferior medial surface is concave and it forms a part of the floor and lateral wall of the nasal cavity. The lateral surface contributes to the part of the medial wall of the pterygo palatine fossa. The sphenoidal process has three borders. The posterior border articulates with the medial pterygoid plate while the medial border articulates with the ala of the vomer. The anterior border forms the posterior margin of the sphenopalatine notch. Let me tell you an interesting fact. Over an international linguistic authority once carried out a research that led to the conclusion that morphological variations in the shape of the palate according to ethnicity led to the differences in phonation of vowel sounds. Now that's all for the anatomical landmarks of the palatine bone. Now let's move on to the muscle attachments onto the palatine bone. Most of the muscles attached to the palatine bone are the same muscles that are forming the soft palate, which is basically helping in the swallowing process. Muscles attached to the palatine bone are the tensor villi palatini, levator villi palatini, palatoglossus, palatopharyngeus, musculus uvula, medial pterygoid muscle. Coming to the tensor villi palatini, it is a broad, thin, ribbon-like muscle. It originates from the medial pterygoid plate of the sphenoid bone. The tendon of the tensor villi palatini attaches to the posterior margin of the palatine bone and forms the insertion into the palatine aponeurosis. The tensor villi palatini tenses the soft palate and by doing so, what it does, it assists the levator villi palatini in elevating the palate to occlude and prevent the entry of food into the nasopharynx during swallowing process. Next, we have the levator villi palatini. It is a thick, rounded, elevator muscle of the soft palate. It arises from the petrous temporal bone and eustachian tube before it is inserted into the palatine aponeurosis. During swallowing, it contracts, causes the soft palate that helps prevents the food from entering the nasopharynx. So, both the levator villi palatini and tensor villi palatini works simultaneously that prevents the entry of food into the nasopharynx. The palatoglossus is a small fleshy fasciculus, narrower in the middle than at either ends. It originates from the palatine aponeurosis and travels anteriorly, laterally, and inferiorly that causes the insertion into the side of the tongue. It elevates the posterior portion of the tongue. It draws the soft palate inferiorly that plays a significant role during swallowing by propelling the food bolus towards the esophagus, including the oral cavity, thereby preventing the retrograde flow of the food. Palatopharyngeus is a longitudinal muscle that extends from the palate to the pharynx. It originates from the palatine aponeurosis and posterior 
of the heart palate, posterior portion of the heart palate, and inserts into the upper border of the thyroid cartilage. Bladder pharyngeus muscle assists deglutition as it shortens the pharynx by elevating it superiorly, anteriorly, and medially. And what does this action do? This action closes the laryngeal airway and prevents the aspiration of food. Musculus uvula is one of the five paired muscles of the soft palate and forms the bulk of the uvula. It originates from the posterior nasal spine of the horizontal plate of the palatine bone and it descends to be inserted into the palatine aponeurosis and mucosa of the uvula. The muscular part of the uvula shortens and broadens the uvula. This allows the soft palate to adapt closely to the posterior pharyngeal wall to help close the nasopharynx during swallowing. By causing the changes in the contour of the posterior part of the soft palate. Now moving on to the medial pterygoid muscle. The lateral surface of the pyramidal process provides attaching surface to the superficial head of the medial pterygoid muscle that belongs to the group of the masticatory muscles, which is basically the chewing function. In synergy with the other masticatory muscles, they are basically helping the chewing process. You can have a complete knowledge of this muscle. Head on to our lecture on sphenoid bone on scaria.com. So I have a cool mnemonic for you to memorize all of these muscle attachments on the palatine bone. So the mnemonic is, my palate mostly likes pleasant taste. The M over here stands for musculus uvula. P stands for palatoglossus. Again, M stands for medial pterygoid muscle. L stands for levator villi palatini. Again, P stands for palatopharyngeus. And lastly, T stands for tensor villi palatini. So that was all for the muscle attachments to the palatine bone. Now let's discuss the clinical osteology related to palatine bones. Clinically speaking, this bone is most often considered in dentistry because of the greater and the lesser palatine nerves that are known to be extremely sensitive. When dentists need to extract the upper molars and premolars, these nerves have to be anesthetized, that is, numbed. Sites of injections need to be carefully monitored. They typically are about one centimeters from the gingival margin. The height of the gums is basically the gingival margin. So there is a risk of the syringe penetrating the greater palatine foramen. In fact, there are clinical guidelines in place to prevent this from happening, and dentists and specialists in particular need to be well versed in the variant anatomy of this bone. Then we have another clinical condition which is known as the torsus palatinus. In some rare instances, doctors have observed torsus palatinus, which is the development of mostly benign, painless outgrowths from the palatine bones. These tend to arise in the mid plate of the palate and can occur bilaterally or just to one side. Though usually asymptomatic and often never noticed by patients, but in some cases it can lead to pain, ulceration in mouth, disrupted chewing, and impaired speech. This condition arises most often in adults in their 30s. In cases where torsus palatinus becomes symptomatic or if it disrupts chewing and speech disability, doctors employ surgeries to alter the shape of the palatine bone and remove the growth. Typically, this involves the incision in the middle of the palate to allow surgeons to get at the problem. So today we have discussed the palatine bones, the major anatomical landmarks and the muscular attachments to the palatine bones.
I hope you have understood the palatine bones. Do comment down below if you have any queries regarding the palatine bones.